Greetings, psychologists. Just to put a bit of context in terms of the timing of this video, today is the 25th of March, 2020. We're in Australia is in the early stages of the coronavirus pandemic. Our state and federal government have what have put in what Australian Chief Medical Officer Brendan Murphy called some draconian measures in terms of social isolation and, and lockdown. So. Um, the vast majority of uh, Victorian schools are in are into remote learning as we speak. So this is a, a shout out to all the students out there at home um, trying to navigate this this difficult time, both in terms of the physical threat, but also the psychological demands on us during this stretch. A, a special shout out to my students from my two classes. I've got the tie dye shirt on as a bit of a tribute. So um, I hope this video is of use. The intent of this video is threefold. I'm going to justify why I think it's imperative that students develop a sound grasp of the information processing model of memory before they can fully grapple the necessary aspects of multi-store model that we're going to cover. I'm going to provide a broad overview of the multi-store model and how it relates to different facets of the course and then we'll identify the key features of the model that students need to demonstrate an understanding of on various forms of assessment. Now, again, in, in terms of my second point from that previous slide, the multi-store model of memory occupies a key knowledge area, but it also relates to some of the concepts that are coming up later in this area of study. So we need to be able to apply the model to the two types of rehearsal that we need to know, maintenance and elaborative. So that relates to short term and long term. We need to be able to relate it to a serial position effect. Many schools, certainly my school, will do a serial position effect experiment. And then we need to be able to explain why we have either a primacy or a recency effect and relate that to both STM and LTM. We also need to be able to talk about symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, like for instance, early signs, early indicators are that patients are suffering from anterior grade amnesia. So relating that to both short term and long term. And then when the um, state, when the disease has is in its advanced stages, the impact on various facets of LTM. And then finally, my favorite um, aspect of this area of study, the reconstruction of memory from LTM back into our SDM and where that can go wrong due to source, source confusion. So that's coming up later in the course. Um, again, this is 2020. Last year's 10 mark extended answer question was on the multi-store model of memory. Um, the good news about this for students was that the fact that it actually provided the uh, image of the, the three memory stores, that, that gave students cues in terms of what they could talk about this. So the scenario was, um, for the 16,000 students that did the exam, they had to basically relate the three memory stores and other concepts that are covered in the area study to a student's first day at school. Now that could have been primary school or secondary school, so there's a bit of wise freedom there. But what was imperative in this question was that not only that students needed to link their response to the scenario, but they needed to show a detailed understanding of the model in terms of both capacity, duration of each of the memory stores, and certainly functionality. So therefore, that's kind of my emphasis on this. Whenever you get a question on the multi-store model of memory, whether you're talking about one of the memory stores or all three, you must weave into your response details about duration and capacity. And that's listed in the study design, and I'll emphasize that a bit later. So imperative that you basically can demonstrate that understanding of capacity, duration and function. Now, the information processing model is not, I repeat, not a key knowledge area of the VCE study design. But to me, the importance of this is the language. I think it's important that students have an understanding of what we mean by encoding, storage and retrieval before we go any further with this area of study. So it's likened to a computer system. Yes, it's a bit dated, but let me just walk you through the key aspects of this. So 
We have sensory systems, tactile, auditory, visual, and their job is to basically detect information in its raw form. That's the sensory memory. Now, let's say light hits the eye. That's as far as it can go in its raw form. We can't transfer light in its raw form to the, to the visual cortex. So that's when we need to encode it. So the metaphor here for the information processing model is we need, to, we need to let our fingers do the walking on the keyboard. We've got an idea and now we need to basically type that information so that it can eventually hit our, um, our hard drive. So encoding is just converting raw information into like a neural impulse or a form that we can actually transfer to the brain. So once we've encoded it, then basically our uh, peripheral nervous system will transfer it to the, to the central nervous system and it will be stored in our cerebral cortex. Our cerebral cortex is the hard drive. That's again, we're going back to the metaphor. So first of all, we need to convert it, then we need to store it into our hard drive. Our hard drive is our, is our cortex for most of our memories. Once it's in the hard drive, the hard drive, hard drive, our brain has a huge capacity, but we're going to need this information on demand. So if we, if we need to recall a password or somebody's name or some key concepts in a test, we need to do a search, all right? And, that's, and we do that search on, via our monitor with our keyboard once again, and then we can put it back into our conscious awareness. So again, the terms here are important. I'll move on. Now, in terms of, of the actual overview of, of the model, it, again, this is more than 50 years old now, but basically the point of the model is that Atkinson and Schifrin were basically explaining to the world that we have these three separate memory stores. They've all got their um, limitations. They've all got key functions, etc. So when we're either storing or encoding information and when we're retrieving it, um, these various memory stores come into play. Now, there are limitations, and we don't really need to know the major limitations of the model. It doesn't explain the biological mechanisms. We've already looked at that with LTP and LTD, some of the early aspects of this area study. But just broadly speaking, first thing, in terms of the three memory stores, first of all, our sensory memory, its job is to detect information in its raw form. Now, Atkinson and Schifrin really just focused on visual and auditory memory. Uh, it was just too hard to worry about tactile, smell, and taste. So that's a limitation of the model, but as far as the course goes, we only really need to know this in terms of iconic or echoic visual or auditory. Once we've detected it in its raw form, we can only hold it there for a brief period, and much of that will fade. So in order for us, in order for the stimuli to go any further, we need to pay attention to it. And once we have paid attention to it, we've got an encoded version that we can work on, we can manipulate in our STM. That's the function of STM, to actually consciously work on material that we've either attended to from sensory memory or retrieved from LTM. Now, the problem with it, the limitation with our STM, it's, it's quite limited in the amount of information it can hold if we're not rehearsing it, um, and also the amount. So much of the material that enters our STM will be displaced or interfered with or will simply fade if we don't um, rehearse it well enough. But what we do rehearse will be encoded. So again, going back to that IP and M um, model, the material that we successfully code will be stored in our LTM, our hard drive, our, our cerebral cortex. And then when we need that, um, the SCM will provide a cue and then we'll be able to put it back, pull that information from our LTM, put it back into SCM for use. So again, as I mentioned with that 10 marker from last year, when you get a question on the multi-store model, you need to weave in this information. How much does the store hold? How long does it hold it for? And, and what's the key function? So in terms of sensory memory, it's got an unlimited capacity. So visually, auditorily, we can basically hold on everything we see, everything we hear for about a third of a second if it's visual up to about four seconds if it's auditory, which is quite functional in relation to speech and processing sentences. So the function of sensory memory is to simply buffer information in its raw form just long enough for us to work out what we need to attend to because if we stored everything and if we actively processed everything that our sensory systems registered, 
we'd have brain overload. So short-term memory, it's out of these three memory stores, it has the most limited capacity. Um, various empirical experiments have demonstrated that most people have a capacity to hold in their STM about five to nine bits of information. Now that could be a, a word, a sound, uh, an image, etc. It can hold it unrehearsed for about 12 to 30 seconds. If we need to keep it in there longer, then we can rehearse. But unrehearsed, that information will fade after about 30 seconds. Again, um, this has been tested empirically. So what's the function of SDM? As I stated before, it's to basically, it's the conscious part of our memory. It's actively working on material that we've attended to from sensory memory. It's also actively working on material that we've retrieved from LTM for use. It's always getting bombarded with material attended to from sensory memory and retrieved from LTM. So, and again, it has its limitations. Now, LTM has an unlimited capacity. The hard part is getting it there because as you know, when you have a six period day at school, like we do at our school, and you're getting hammered with material from your teachers, you get to the end of the day and you kind of feel like it's all gone. So again, we might have, we've registered it in our sensory memory, we might have consciously processed and worked on it in our STM, but it just hasn't been encoded. We haven't been able to hit that LTP um, threshold and, be, uh, and store in a meaningful way this material in our, in our cortex. So we need to, and, and again, think back to LTP, repetition's the key. We need to repeatedly activate those weak neural traces responsible for that memory trace. So the, the function of LTM, once we can get that material in there, is to store the material in, a, in an organized fashion so that we can cue that memory back into our short-term memory um, when we need it. If you want any more detail on any of these stores, then you can actually check out some of some videos that I've made um, retrospectively on this.